channel is opportunities in consulting. Some of you know what that means. Some of, to some of you, it may be a deep, dark mystery, and we're all going to learn something about real life in the consulting field, of what you do, how you get there. And our moderator for this session will be another one of our great BME uh, working group, Lawrence Chu. So, um, during that, so many people, and uh, I'm Lawrence Chu, the graduate student uh, in biomedical engineering. Now the PhD student, and uh, what I saw uh, among my friends is that either they are undergraduate or the graduate or even the postdoc, some of their choices for the career is consulting. So today we are very glad to invite three people to share. Um, they will share their experience, how they got the job, how they got the job, and their suggestions to us. So the first speaker is uh, Mark Gold, and uh, he is the senior manager at Center. And then the second uh, speaker is uh, Darsh Darshow Barry, <laughs> and uh, he is the co-president at Johns Hopkins Business Consulting Club. And uh, the third speaker is Danny Matar, and uh, he is now the new hire consultant at. So we are very uh, glad to hear uh, the speaking, and each one should have a uh, 10 minutes talk, and then afterwards, then it's open to all the questions. Okay. All right, so you want me to just do an introduction? Um, yes. Thank you. Okay, so I'm Mark Gold. I'm a senior manager at Accenture. I've been at Accenture for 10 years now. Uh, I've been um, doing work related to uh, databases, large databases, enterprise class uh, databases, and technology architecture in architectures in the data center for about 17 years. Um, I did my undergraduate chemistry at Fresno State, and then my PhD was at the School of Public Health. I worked uh, as a graduate student in environmental health sciences. Uh, my advisor was a guy named Mike Washabout in the Department of Biochemistry there at the School of Public Health. And I uh, graduated in 1994. Um, spent about a couple of years at the University of Maryland as a postdoc um, and uh, left that to try and uh, bootstrap a career in the chemistry industry. Uh, was pretty unsatisfied at that point they decided to make a career transition in 1998 at which time um, I started doing work with Oracle databases. I started, started in consulting and I've been in consulting in the last 10 years. Um, the last couple of years at Accenture I've uh, uh, run our North American database technologies practice and about about 30 plus people in that group reporting to me um, and uh, recently moved over to a new practice we've started around Oracle Engineered Systems. These are hardware platforms specialized uh, purchase bill, helping our clients solve their unique problems using this infrastructure in the data center. And for the last year I was the infrastructure lead for a project we did in the state of Ohio where uh, we implemented a form of care act for the state of Ohio. So a very successful program. Um, we've done we've got about a billion dollar line of business around Affordable Care Act, integrated eligibility, health insurance exchanges, and also uh, are the prime on the program in the state of California. And uh, a lot of that work led to Accenture being selected to take over healthcare.gov about a month, month or so ago. Had some involvement around helping them figure out what to do next to help them go. Okay. So uh, basically, I um, did my undergrad from University of Illinois. I came to Hopkins for a PhD. I'm here in the Department of Pharmacology. And it was like sometime in 2011, three years before my graduation, I decided that I was interested in consulting. And that's really when I started preparing for consulting career. So I'm the exact opposite. 
<laughs> and um, some of the things I did to really explore myself. So there are two things. First is whether I'm really interested in a career like this, and second is the preparation part. So for kind of, kind of trying to get to know whether I'm interested in a consulting career, I tried to expose myself to as many different aspects of it as possible. So this could be these competitions, being part of the club, um, talking to people in networking events, trying to see what uh, their job description looks like, uh, participating in workshops, uh, and then also there was a student run consulting company at Hopkins, which started by BME students uh, that I uh, worked for a little while. And what I gathered from all of this is that is something I enjoy. Uh, definitely the problem solving is the major aspect, but also you get to work with people at a constant time. So, yeah, and then in order to really so that was the preparation part, and then application was mainly like the last year, where you know you really have to decide that two, as I think the conversation will go, there are two different kinds of companies. One are the big generalist firms, um, and then the second is a very specialized life sciences companies. And if you really want to do problem solving, you don't really care about which industry you want to get into, the generalist is a better option for you. If you still want to do the life sciences or specialize from, from the get-go and want to be part of that aspect, then you can, you know, channel yourself towards more the life sciences or deep fields. So that's it. Okay. Uh, so uh, my name is Dan Young. I come from Lebanon. Uh, I'm originally I'm a physician there, so I graduated from the in Lebanon, and I got an MBA here at Johns Hopkins. Uh, so basically, when I I'm now a <coughs> postdoc in transplant pathology uh, at the School of Medicine. So uh, when I became interested in consulting, it was maybe my last year of my school, I was not really interested anymore in clinical work. And basically it's the same process that Darcy had talked about. So first, it's really important for you to know what type of work you're going to do there, and if you, to know that if you really like that work or not. So I uh, I read a lot about it. I went to like, the big company's website, where I read everything about the type of work they do, and the like, baby work of like, a consultant there. And uh, if you have friends who work in the industry, I think it's very important to talk with them and ask them in detail about like, types of projects and see if you like that. Uh, so uh, when I decided that this is something I really want to do, uh, I started my application process. And basically there are two things you need to know about that. First of all, uh, choose the type of companies. So uh, if you want to be a specialist in something or do you work with big companies, but also uh, start preparing for your interview process, because the interview process and even the application process is a bit different than what we do in academia. So uh, like the CV that you have to have and the resume that you have to have is very different than the resume that you have here. And it's completely different. Mine doesn't really mention anything about any clinical training. And uh, this is an important thing. You need to talk more about your skills as leaders and as people who can communicate and work hard and solve problems. And the second part is preparing also for the case interviews, because uh, the cases are, like, you all your interviews will feature cases in them, and it's very important to train yourself very well in that. There are many books out there, you can use any of these books, all of them are good, as long as you learn like, how to run through a case and think about a case. Uh, so uh, this is basically how it started. It's, uh, I, I, I used to come here to all the networking events, like the recruitment events that those companies did, BCG comes here every year, McKinsey comes here every year, and uh, uh, some smaller firms also come over for the, like, at the School of Public Health when they do their career, the uh, career chair. So uh, this is basically how you decide if you want to go there. And ju but just know very well what it means. Like it's, the projects that they do are very different than what we do here. We don't, they don't focus, focus a lot on, like they don't go into detail in one topic and like, just try to get every information they have on that. The, the perspective is we have a problem and we're trying to collect the usual the, the useful information and be succinct and like summarize that in a way that can solve this problem instead of like focusing on one thing like we do in our research projects as postdocs. So basically like, that's it I guess.
So, uh, I mean, the, the projects that you get, is, uh, depending on the firm. So, you, if you have, you're working with the firms that work in strategy consulting, so you're working more on with you work, you work with firms that uh, like come over to the company to ask you about some problems in their business model or their strategy, like maybe they're not making enough money, or enough profits, or like they have, uh, they want to buy another company and they want to assess if this is a good thing to do or not. So you get a project and then your, your work is to uh, gather the, data, the information that you need to assess that problem and then try to find, uh, try, try to see if work, like let's say we're talking about a company that doesn't, it's not making profits. So if you want to come and see, uh, whether uh, there is a the problem, like maybe they have high costs in their like, structure. So why is that happening? Why? How can we solve this? And then try to suggest solutions. So this is like in summary what, what the type of work that you do. In life science companies, you can also you work a lot on with like drug companies that also want to help, like want your help in assessing how to what kind of markets to focus on, for example, or, uh, what is the best way to proceed, like in some for like the long term strategies. So these are the problems. So we're, you know, Accenture's tagline is, is high performance delivered. So we're, what we do for companies is help improve business performance. And, you know, um, Accenture is now about 281,000 employees worldwide. So it's, it's substantially larger than McKinsey. And, um, McKinsey is focused mostly, mainly on this, what we call management consulting, and certainly Accenture retains a very large discipline in management consulting. But um, if you look at the group that I'm part of, it's very focused on technology consulting. Um, so we're split into what we call our growth platforms, which are largely um, made up of folks who specialize in technologies, and it's the entire brand. I don't think there's anything we untouched from a technology perspective. And then we have our five operate, industry operating groups, so resources, products, resources do things like oil and gas, uh, products, um, things like the retail companies like Best Buy, um, health and public service, um, and communications and media and so on. So we touch, we have all of our clients divided into these five industry groups. Um, but by and large, we're in there trying to help uh, business, businesses become high performing. So um, in, in the case of the state of Ohio, you know, it's, a, it's implementing Affordable Care Act, but doing so in such a way that the, states can hand, the state can handle the influx of those citizens who, who are looking for health insurance, uh, the federal government's health insurance. Prior to that, I uh, helped in the state of Ohio. I was at Shell for about nine, ten months and helped them strategize a way of reducing non discretionary expenditures on uh, one of the, on their, their um, entire database technology in the state. So, Shell is a, we call a super major oil and gas company, it's extremely large. Have an extremely large technology estate across, the, across many, many technologies. Databases are horrible. They have a huge, they have a huge outlay of non-discretionary expenditures. We want to help them standardize, consolidate, become more agile in the data center, such that they reduce those non-discretionary expenditures, can, can move more money towards innovation and improving how business operates. I did the same with the PG group in Houston, it's formerly British Gas. We went in there initially to write strategy, write a couple strategies, game-based technology strategies to do. Uh, it's very, it very much more on the management consulting side, um, IT strategies. And so we've got methodologies that we apply to analysis on that level, do stakeholder interviews, process, analyze, and present back to the um, client what we think their top opportunities are for, um, again, reducing non-discretionary expenditures, improving their ability, their agility in the data center, and 
improving their ability to uh, be more flexible and agile from a business standpoint. We did that for both databases and integration technologies. Um, so that that's that's what I is my kind of daily little consultant. Um, I'm a technology specialist, so a lot of what I'm called upon to do is to advise clients on on specific technology and technology architectures. Uh, it's not limited to that, of course. Um, we do we do a you can imagine a company that large. We do a crazy uh, amount of very projects. And they're, something that Danny mentioned, and he mentioned a lot about the quantitative analysis that you do, but also another component of your job description is qualitative analysis that you can do. So what I mean by qualitative is whether it's gathering data directly from the company you're working for, your client. So people working there say, if you want to know how does this product sell in these stores, they are the best person to ask. Or asking, calling up physicians or key opinion leaders in the field and asking them, and you know, if we have this drug, do you use it? What are the factors you would consider? This is more for like life sciences and technology speaking. So that's the big point. I'd like to hear from each of you for someone with the background of our audience, with a master's, with a doctorate in life sciences, health sciences, who's interested in moving into a consultant career. How much does your set of qualifications matter, and how much does your being a good fit? Matter what that means. I would say they are both equally important. I don't know really not prioritize one above the other. When I decided that I wanted to make, make a career change, it was a very big change, of course. Um, and, you know, everybody understands this way. So I worked really super hard on the it was really hard. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. It's no joke. I did some really hard things, difficult things for clients. And, I mean, we stood up for the Care Act in the state of Ohio in eight months. Um, that was really hard and from a standing stop. It had nothing in the data center. So that was hard. But there's nothing that compares the novel difficulty by earning my Hopkins PhD. And so that, the training, when I decided I was going to switch careers, uh, one of the key, key drivers or conclusions I had about forging that change is that I'm very smart and I know how to think. I know how to think very deeply about complex technical problems. In Mike's lab, we were interested in the activities of thiamine as a coenzyme, elucidating mechanisms of enzyme catalyzed reactions, physical organic chemistry. So it was really heady stuff. And, and, and that, in, in, and then the broader education uh, in my Hopkins graduate education, I'm a superior thinker, right? I'm, I just have training that most don't have the benefit. And I decided that I'm smart, I know how to solve complex technical problems, I know that that's useful in more than just the scientific world, you know, more than just that. And I'm going to apply that. So that was, that was really critical. And it turns out to be true. Um, one of, I was, I was talking to somebody this morning and sharing that one of the things, epiphanies I had when I started working with Oracle databases or relational databases because it was as technically complex as anything that I ever wanted to do. Uh, relational model theory, and how relational databases operate, is, is very sort of black art to mouse, and very technically complex. So it was really, really nicely aligned with my personal interest. I like it as complex, technically complex as it can be. Um, on the other hand, and this is, this, I think this is important, um, and it may be hard to do, but 
yeah, I made the jump, but I tell you, it took about a year and a half for me to sort of like um, uh, get over the ego part of it, right? And that's the fit part. You're moving into the workforce. Yes, I, I really like being called Dr. Gold, but it's a new, it's kind of a new arena to play in. And that's really, that was really actually very hard to do. I, I had expectations for another, another path, but I just wasn't happy with it. So I took a different path. And, and yeah, you, you've got to fit in. So I think that's, that's a very important consideration to go from rarefied air and ivory tower to you know, one of the masses. Uh, the way I look at this is uh, your PhD, so if you think of a consultant job, you need your hard skill sets and your soft skill sets, right? So the fit is where, when the fit comes under the soft skills, and your PhD really helps you for the hard skills. So, you know, the important component of getting in a consultant job is your interviews, the case interviews. And if you, given that you have, you have a PhD background with enough practice, you can really excel in your hard skill set group. But then the soft skills is a personality. That's something harder to change, um, and that's what you know. So there are people who are amazing problem solvers can crack any case you give them. But when it comes to the personality, they are not a good fit for the company, and the company would not hire them just for that. And I think that's where the two. I agree completely with Mark. It's like 50-50. Yeah, and we're looking at that. I mean, when you go through interviews, there are multiple layers of interviews at Accenture. I think you do probably three interviews alone just with HR before you do probably an on-site and then ultimately you get to an assessment day with me and I'm like the final arbiter of opinion. Um, and I do this on a regular basis, I repeat on a regular basis. So long before you get to talk to me, um, HR is doing all sorts of personality profiling. They're looking and they're very good at it. They're looking to make sure that, you know, from a culture standpoint, it's a fit. And I, I'm, I'm going to say it's probably the same at Kinsey as it is at Accenture. Accenture culture is very, very important to everybody who works here, especially in our consulting workforce. You know, you know, Accenture, I don't know if everybody knows this, Accenture is formerly Anderson Consulting. Anderson Consulting was part of Arthur Anderson. So the partners in Anderson Consulting and Arthur Anderson got into a bit of a spat about money, as usual. They divorced, and it was a, and then, but they had to rename Anderson Consulting as part of the divorce. And um, it was a couple years later that Arthur Anderson implodes over the Enron. Accenture is what, it's not the only thing that remains, but it's, it's what's gone forward. So the, my point is that the culture at Accenture goes very far back, it's 60, 70 years back. And it's very strong, very deep. I was talking with the managing director I work for today. This afternoon, just before I came here, we were talking about somebody who's not quite fitting in. And one of those we were able to agree, hey, that's a part of our culture. This thing we need her to, you know, this behavior we're observing, that's, that's never going to change. This is too deep. I want to add something just talking about hard skills. So uh, there's, uh, at least in management consulting, and probably uh, uh, if you're not going to be uh, doing very specialized work in domain of expertise, you're going to need uh, things that they call complex transferable skills that you have used in your work as a postdoc or PhD that you're going to be able to apply in another setting. And basically, for, for us, I think the best the most important transferable skills that we have is the fact that we can think about the problem, we can formulate hypotheses, and then find ways to prove them and see based on our evidence like what to recommend, like what to continue. And this is practically what we're expected to do in like different settings. So this is like the transferable skill that I guess we can have and that is like will be an asset for us if we're going to go into consulting. And uh, as both, both of the panels said, like the, the fit part is very important. Like McKinsey, I did uh, 
uh, three rounds of interview and in other companies I did maybe two depending on the company. And in every time there was one, like half of the interview about the fifth part where they ask you about, they ask you about situations that you need to talk about that happened with you where you need to show some communication skills, some leadership skills, some teamwork skills, like if you had a conflict with somebody, like if you had uh, a problem and how you like manage to lead the group to solve that problem, things like that. So it's really important to be able to show you that, that you can fit into the culture of the company because you'll be dealing with clients. And these clients are very highly ranked in the company that you will be at. So they want you to be able to be there and be able to represent the company. they can lead all the way up through you know, managers and senior managers. Um, and, uh, and problem solvers. And uh, it makes all of that together, you know, you've got to be smart and capable, but you also have to have leadership qualities. That makes that makes it very challenging for the world to, to survive it and excel in uh, consulting especially at places like McKinsey and Accenture, where the expectations are, are very, very high. And the higher you go, the higher the expectations are, and the more tenuous it might feel. Um, the, uh, I think, uh, what I was say is, <coughs> well, I know, I'm sorry. When I interview candidates, especially once they get to me, they've been through rounds. I've already had one of my folks technically screen them, so that's fine. Or the new hire, so there's no technical screening, but they've been through three or four interviews already. So by the time they get to me, it's the last bridge to cross. And what I'm looking for are leadership qualities. Because really, frankly, I don't, I, I need, you, you look at their resumes, and by the way, I interview a lot of Hopkins guys, and, um, you look at their resumes and you're like, it's just mind blowing, right? And academics, I mean, they're superstars, like crazy, good. And, but, so they, and they're all look present that way. So they're all geniuses, they're all superstars. So when I'm looking for people who have got demonstrated leadership qualities, my daughter's boyfriend is a freshman at Maryland this year. I had done an assessment day and I brought home the resumes, like five people I spoke to that day. I said, take a look at these, Aaron. And he's like, you know, looking at these, these are Hopkins folks. And he's he's just like amazed at the resumes, right? These, these are very successful in academics, academically. And uh, I said, do you see that one? I got throw it back, toss it back. Because they lack the leadership. I just had the sense wasn't quite there from the leadership. Quality. And when you talk about people who are getting into consultants, senior consultants, bottom managers, or like this person that I was talking about, with my managing director about, you know, I'm looking for leadership qualities and looking for people who can lead. It's really important. And after five or six years at, in consulting, you really expect it to be clearly demonstrating the capability to lead. Lead yourself, lead your peers, lead your teams, lead the client. Cannot emphasize that strongly Just one note about the transferable skill set is basically, it's like modified transferable skill sets. And what I mean by that is, say, if you're a good presenter, you can present really well. That's just as, a, as an example. Um, you can present your research, but the way you present your research and the way you present say your deck of slides to your client, I mean, you use the same presenting skills and the same skills to make a presentation, there's some, you know, just change, changes of industry, right? So that's something that you just learn on the job. Yeah, to that, I'm sorry. And, and I don't, he's absolutely right. But this is a pet peeve of mine. And I have a team in California and I'm coaching on this. Is, and this is the problem with technical people. They all come with this problem. You can't see the forest or the trees. It's learning how to present something concisely and wait for somebody to ask you for additional information. And I, this one team is starting from zero. 
you know, I'm coaching them on it. So it's all a bunch of deep, really seriously deep technical guys. They're all really good. They're all very deeply skilled. And they all come with that problem. It's just they cannot <laughs> figure out on their own when to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Presentation skills. So I'm still not clear about this leadership quality that you spoke about. So how do you gain that leadership quality? And sort of can you give an example of that? say the having that like, how do you get your own know, like this leadership quality coming from an academic background in biochemistry? So how do you gain that it's punished? Punished. <laughs> failures, lots of failures. Um, what I'm looking for on a resume, like a brand new person. I'm looking for people, it's going to sound stupid, but it's so simple. I am really looking for people who are involved in extracurriculars, right? Um, like yourself, leading this, <laughs> <laughs> all the logistics involved here, you know, radio speakers, make sure everybody can, knows that this is happening, driving it, probably doing a lot more after the fact. It's these things, these are really important. This isn't the only activity. There's there are there's a thousand different things. I don't know. Um, you know, just being out there and, and and doing more. I talk about it this way. I want to see consultants. Um, I see Accenture Consulting as thirty-five thousand small businesses. Accenture is the enabler. Of, is your enabler to grow your consulting business. I have a global consulting business. Right? There are people on Europe and Asia Pac call me or write me on a regular basis asking me to talk to them about the kinds of things that I've been talking about. And so I but I've started from nothing. I just got a chance to come in the door. But I've earned a reputation at the firm. It's a global reputation. And um, and the way I describe it to people is I've grown my business outside the three walls of my cubicle. I know. I, it's important to be focused and hands down. You've got problems to solve, papers to write, and data analyze. But I'm not just thinking like what's in front of me. I'm also thinking what's outside me. And I'm demonstrating that what's outside of what I do is also important. You do a little bit of that, and then somebody offers you a new opportunity to lead a little bit more, and you take that. That was the lecture that, sh that this person got this morning from me, um, and which is you're given opportunities to drive something, you've got to take a hold of it. I mean, you're expected to do that. And you do that, and you communicate what you're doing to leadership, and you demonstrate that you can, you can own things and drive things. So that's part of it. I own things and I drive things. And then I get bigger things to own and drive. Um, so that's one part. And then there's their extracurriculars. Like I said, I ran our North American database technologies practice. So all the deepest skilled Oracle specialists, database specialists in North America reported to me. And so that was a great opportunity. i would wanted it for years. I was so happy when I finally got a chance to do that. I earned that opportunity by demonstrating that I could lead people. Um, you learn how to coach people. That's another quality of a leader. It's not just me. I have people who I want to follow me up, right? I take an interest in their what they're doing, and I coach them. I've got opportunities to do that at Accenture, coach people. Um, so I think that's it. I just, I just, I'm, I am. Um, I'm attracted to opportunities to lead, and I get them, and I pick them, and drive them, and then I get bigger opportunities to lead. So, so, so I uh, wanted to ask also about you and Danny about your leadership. Yeah. So, so I was say, how do you gain the leadership by the appointed or by the extracurricular activity you want to share with? You? Yeah. Sure. So there are two things. Like when you think about that, and if you want to show that in your application, there are two things. First of all, as Mark said, extracurricular activities are important. Like I have a, I have a section in my resume about the leadership experience. It's called leadership experience, and I post like 
in my case, I was student assembly president. I was the secretary in a nonprofit organization, so I hosted these. And this is a, a first thing to do. So you need to be involved in uh, like leadership positions in terms of your extracurricular activities. The second part is that whenever you're describing the work that you did, be it in extracurricular or in your work, if there's some situations where you were needy, you need to show that. So that if you're head of your research team, it's not the same thing as if you were part of the team. And it's important to mention that when you write your resume, like you should say that you were leading the team in that point. And uh, same thing for extracurricular activities. Describe what you did. Uh, and uh, the second thing is that uh, when they ask you questions, they're going to ask you questions about situations that would definitely happen to you if you were in a leadership position. Like, there's no leadership position that can go smoothly without like, any conflict or any problem. And this is, this is the point where they want to see how you work. Like, when you had a problem, how did you deal with it? How did you solve it? And these are stuff that you would get when you would be in leadership position. So this is why it's both important to, to see <coughs> positions where you are leading or you are guiding the team. And small stuff can matter. Like even if you were in the nonprofit for a month and you did something on your own, this matters. You have to mention it. Uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe you can even mention that you were like a sports team captain. Because these are stuff where you're, you're leading a team and you're talking with people, communicating with them, and this is what they want to see. So uh, be involved in stuff outside your work, but also make sure to emphasize when you are leading within your own work, because you always you have your own projects that you lead where you have a team that works with you and where you're coordinating everything. So this would be basically my advice. Uh, I actually completely agree with that here, because you know, it doesn't really matter what your leadership position is, whether you are like a leader of a club or you know you could be in your research group, but you really need to communicate that. So because as long as you've shown leadership, you've gained that skill set that you can talk about. So as long as you can communicate that, it doesn't really matter. How's your work life Talk about work-life balance. I work a lot. I spent 25 days in September. I spent 25 days in Columbus. Um, we work a lot, but I mean, there, you know, it's it's kind of the nature of consulting. We're all type A's. We're all obsessive compulsive workers. Um, and like the approach you guys take to doing graduate school, which I know is type A obsessive compulsive works really well I consult and I just pull those strings, push those buttons all the time. Um, so it worked out really well. Um, I think you I think that we're I think you yeah, need to take responsibility for that really in a sense. Like I was looking at my I was looking at my PTO balance just this morning and I'm thinking, oh that's out of control. What I mean by that is that there's no way I'm going to be able to use everything I'm going to collect this year before the end of August comes when they whack off everything that's unused. So it's my responsibility to make sure those days are getting used, right? It's given to me for a reason. Some years I'm better about it than others. Um, but I think it's a responsibility to know when it is time to take a break, um, so, uh, I've always had a, a strong belief in what Stephen Covey says. You you need to take time to sharpen the saw. You can't go at it forever and expect to be to have the same effectiveness. So you need to take time to refresh uh, and yourself, get back into shape, you know, sort of mentally, physically, so you're ready to go at it. Because I'll tell you do a project like we did last year in the state of Ohio, and you're going to get ground down. It, it, is a, it, is a, it is a ridiculous grind. They're not, they're not every year, they're not every project's like that, but they do come, and they are a grind like, you know, um, something you haven't experienced before. Uh, uh, my first one, I'm going to start working couple of months, but I can share with you two information that I have. Uh, when one of the recruitment sessions, they posted some schedule for the people who work at the firm. So it's pretty tough in terms of hours. I, they start working in the same sort of working, checking emails and emails and stuff, and then the meetings kind of on. 
they finish maybe six, seven, eight, 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 eight. Uh, like, um, sometimes more, depending on how loaded the projects are. I also, the second information I know is that many of them, they start to focus now on the importance of uh, life versus work balance. I don't know how this is ending up happening. I can tell you a couple of months. But uh, I know that so it's, it's intense, like you have a lot of work to do. And, uh, a lot of meetings and a lot of things to do, so it's like you're more, uh, it's tougher maybe than uh, work, time where like, you, you, you manage your own time, but you can't manage your own time the whole day, but um, yeah, so this is what I can do. And especially when you join for the first year, you're going to have a steep learning curve, so obviously it's going to be much harder, but from what I've heard from talking to people is that as you go further in your career, it does become better. self-selecting, right? You're really good. So it's like I say, you have to manage it yourself. You gotta know, you gotta be able to read your body, read your mind, and say, hey, I think I think it's time for me to sort of like step away for a couple of days. Good have a shake tea. Relax. Okay, thank you. So uh, when the people in the middle and the right hand side Accenture, our analyst, consultant, manager, senior manager, managing director, and there are four levels of managing directors. Um, and that's the hierarchy as well. Um, so typically, um, I report to a managing director. It's not exclusive. I reported to senior manager last year, but Andrew was uh, tapped to get promoted to managing director this year. So it's kind of a catch-22 for me. I'm competing with him last year in terms of ratings. We'll be rated at the same time. But then again, he's on track to get promoted last year managing director. So he and I have a really great relationship. So I have a problem with that. Just, just balance that. But to, on a team like my team last year at Ohio, I had a couple of managers, I had a few consultants, and a couple of analysts, and a couple of others that kind of went. And so, but all of those people reported up to me and I'm senior. Not very different, maybe the adjustment is like you sign as an analyst and as a consultant associate, uh, a senior associate, uh, the manager, the adjustment partner. Uh, now, as a as a PhD or postdoc, we're considered advanced degrees. So you don't start as analyst. You start as an associate, which is the same thing as if you earned an MBA, uh, if you work in a business background. Some other companies, I, I, know, I know about Maybe BCG is the same. I know that Booz, you don't start at the same level. You start one level below, so you'll be a senior consultant first. Uh, but yeah, so you don't start from like the entry level. You start a bit higher in the hierarchy because you're in a vast degree. And the application process also is different. Like You don't compete with a business background person for when you're applying. Uh, we have a different, like when I was interviewing at McKinsey, we, had, like, the, we were a group that had a path in terms of like first jump, second jump, third jump, when we, there weren't any MBA people with us because they interviewed different. So. What do you mean then when you look at MBAs 
so uh, I mean, I don't know what they do personally, like the, 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 the entire system, but we don't think they're the same. Like, the, we're not on the same, we're not pulled together. Cases, like uh, they probably expect more from them. Uh, what I know is that the cases and the interview process is the same whether you're applying for like an internship or a job. Uh, but first of all, there's one difference. We do a problem solving test. They don't do that. The MBA don't do the problem solving test. We do it because some, like some advanced degree applicants do not come from a quantitative like, or analytical background. So the problem solving test is a written test and we did this was the first one. The, the goal was to see if you have analytical skills. And if you pass that, then you have two rounds of interview. And then in the, in, in the rounds of interview, it's, you're, we're just interview as, like, all the people who interview in these rounds are advanced degrees. So the, the MBA and business background people, they have, they interview on their own. And so if they're comparing applications, they don't compare you with them, because uh, uh, you, you might be at a disadvantage. But, uh, I don't know if the, the cases are the same, but I would expect that they would expect that the, the answers that you give should be a bit like different. Like you're taking into account the background difference, being business. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So probably the, the expectations would be different between the advanced degrees and the business, but that's why we're not, we weren't put together. Um, I didn't have two different questions. Um, one is on a general basis. I know the culture you talked about, talk about a little bit. Uh, it differs in different companies and companies, but how, how does the support system work? Like, let's say you're, you're part of a team, uh, are you expected to work on an individual basis and then you're differentiated on your individual performance? Or, or more like you're working on a team and then you're helping each other out, it's more collaborative effect? Uh, that's one question. And then the second one would be uh, more specific. So, let's say you're a master's, you have a master's degree. Are you considered part of an advanced degree? Uh, up to Temple, or are you considered more in terms of an undergraduate up to Temple? I don't think we differentiate degrees. I, you know, when I went to Accenture and my PhD, I didn't get this sense that they were looking at me differently than every other candidate. I went in as a consultant. Um, so I don't know if Accenture does that or not, but it's been 10 years since I did the hiring process. So. I'm really not sure about that. Um, in terms of project life, it's very collaborative. It's, it's expected to be collaborative. There are, in fact, you want to stay away, in, most of them want to stay away from being labeled individual contributor. That's actually not a good title. Um, roles where you're individual contributor tend to be um, minimized relative to those who are leading teams and so therefore working highly collaboratively. Um, and I think it's by necessity because the projects we do are big. Look at Ohio, it's $350 million program over three to five years. Um, it's, you know, uh, you can, there's 200 people trying to get this done in eight months. You, you can't operate as an individual. You're not you know, the researcher focused on a very narrow, relatively speaking, narrowly defined problem. You know, um, it's not like that. You're, you're part of a team, and you have to be very good at doing that. If you're not a, if you're not a team player, uh, if you don't know how to collaborate well, um, and that's part of a fit thing, fitting in the culture, if you're not good at that, I can always speak for Accenture. But if you're not good at that, you're going to struggle. So, your question about uh, uh, if you have a master's degree, uh, so uh, I know that it's a thing of context, but at DCG, when they did this group, and they typically emphasize on the fact that they are looking for uh, advanced degrees and uh, PhDs and PhDs. Uh, at McKinsey, it was different. There were master's degree applicants. So, I have a question. This is somewhat related to the work-life balance question. I have the impression that there's quite a bit of travel and potentially relocation as well involved in consulting. Is that a fair characterization of the work order? Well, uh, this year, 
I earned myself lifetime platinum premier status in area. So my job to people mostly who are checking me in the hotel is but that the only thing that means is I've spent a lot of time in your bed. And I am. So yes, it's fair to say. It's a lot of travel. It's a hundred percent travel. So uh, a lot of time on airplanes. So it really it depends like if you are a bigger company or a boutique company. So I can speak for the boutique companies which are what a life science, if you have life science specialist companies, actually they don't have a money most of them don't have a money to call their travel schedule. So their clients are more local and you know, maybe just go for a meeting at the start of the uh, project, a mid project at the end, and that's it. So go and get the previous status. <laughs> Uh, so the thing is that the work that most of the work happens at the client side. Uh, so that's why it's a lot of travel people. Uh, for example, for me, they say that I should have spent it four days away from the Four days from the five days where you're going to be out of your uh, that local office to work at the client side. Now, uh, sometimes you can find these options where you can take projects within your uh, office like close by where you live. So that can, can, can ease up some of your traveling. But you should expect traveling. I'm required to have a driving license. And I'm expected to use it to travel to find friends. So yeah, you don't work in the office. So I've uh, never gotten to do a project in Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. So we are now open to one or two questions. I would like to mention the life sciences specialized consulting companies. Can you give a few examples? Yeah, so uh, on the East Coast, there would be Clearview, uh, for example, Clearview in Boston. There's LEK, uh, but I'm not sure what LEK is travel. Uh, there is Lyric Swan, is some of that, uh, Partner Associates, Health Advances. Uh, that's basically, if you just go Google Life Sciences okay. Consulting Companies, there's a big list com that comes up. And, you know, we have, there's some that can take away. Actually, for curiosity, uh, two of you have been through interview and process, and one of you are a senior manager. Senior manager. And uh, I'm wondering what kind of question you are asked, or you will ask as for the final round, when people have been stripped off from the HR, from the technical questions. What kind of questions do you really being asked and are, are, are kind of uh, prone to ask? And what are you looking for? From are, are you are you comfortable with 100% travel? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that would be one. The answer's got to be that you're going to need to ask that 50 times because you want to be sure it's not going to really blow you up. It's not easy. It sounds glamorous. I mean, I'm close to Marriott Renaissance for an entire year. My home away from home. It sounds glamorous. Mm -hmm. It isn't. Not after 10 years of that. Um, but it's when I'm interviewing, I'm looking, I'm asking questions about leadership. Um, I'm not so concerned about the details of the resumes, you know, grade, point average, and the like. That's all been embedded by the time I see them. Um, I want to, I want to get to into the details. If they say they led this project team, then I want to know what did you do. Then. A lot of candidates struggle with this, I, and I have to stop them, and I will, and I'll tell them, I know that it was a group project and you all together accomplished something, but what I'm asking you is what did you do? So I don't want to hear, we did this, I hear, I did this. So you have to be ready for that. And it's your turn to shine anyways. It, they're really, in that interview, it's your opportunity to say, I did this, I did that. Even though you may not be comfortable doing that, you should do it. I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to add so I, I may be getting three questions on what to The questions that I got were, in terms of fit questions, I was asked if I'm a, I was in a group. Like, give me a situation when you were in a group and you had an obstacle. 
and you emerged to lead the group past the obstacle. I was asked about, give me an example when you had a problem with a coworker or somebody on your team <coughs> and how you dealt with it. Uh, I was, uh, and I had like some different formulations of these questions, like asked many times. And the second part is also the case part. You always have a case. Now the cases in the final round can be more, less structured than in the other round. So like I got a case about what do you think about uh, that Google had to use it in, uh, a new application where you can pay people to give you advice on the net or something. I forgot the name of the application. But the question was, tell you what you think about it. Why would Google do something? Thanks. That was the question. Uh, so okay. the cases are less structured also. Like smaller companies, um, so like life science, particular companies, they actually they really depend company to company. So some companies have a very structured case fit, some companies are only fit, some companies are only case. So that really depends on the size of the company. Which do you have a lot of pressure? 